Dear audience, welcome to the So Power Chat. In today's episode, we'll be discussing about women empowerment in Nepal. Joining us today is Ms. Waini Kushuma, country representative of UN Women in Nepal. Please allow me to welcome her. Welcome to the show, Ms. Kushuma. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. How have you been? Well, very well, thank you. Well, you are here as the country representative of UN Women uh, in Nepal for the last two and a half years. How do you assess the development situation in relation to women empowerment? I think I'd like to start by recognizing that Nepal has a history of strong commitments to gender equality and women's empowerment. And uh, that's reflected in everything from your constitution of 2015 uh, to the gender quota in the elections. So uh, this is a country where you serve as a model for other nations in which you're able to say, this is what we're doing, we're serious about it. And at the same time, that's true, of course, we're looking at a new governance system of federalism in Nepal. And therein, in the transition in governance, I think we have an opportunity to strengthen even further, uh, given that typically, and this would not be just in one country, not just in Nepal, but every country would have a gap between what is intended and what is stated and what is in reality uh, uh, the conditions of women. Well, what are the key messages that Nepal can deliver to international community in relation to a reform into existing, you know, large that you are referring uh, that of the new constitution? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I wanted to point to the quotas. The, the quotas here are r really exercised in a degree and an extent in scope that I have not seen elsewhere, um, really. But it's not just on gender. Of course, you have quotas on, on different dimensions of identity and representation. But insofar as the quota is concerned, in UN Women, we are actually very strongly saying that the gender quota in elections, but not just in elections, in appointments, in representation, are the quickest way to make historical corrections of discrimination. Uh, so this would be one arena in which people would look to Nepal and say, how are they doing this in Nepal? And with regard to the quota, I can say that what is required now are programs in support of the women who were recently newly elected in 2018. You cannot achieve sustainable change without having the programs of support. And given that federalism uh, took place quite rapidly and we are now uh, um, really rolling out new programs of support, that would include capacity development. And, and I would just want to emphasize that that is a strong need. Well, that's really interesting, uh, Ms. Kushuma. You see, on one hand, women are in leading position in the recent days. That may be due to the new constitution, you know, its participatory approach in the leading position, especially that of the state organs, from president to you know, judiciary. But on the other hand, women are subject to the violence of different natures, and they are seeking for justice to themselves. They have become the victims of different violences that took place against them, within house or outside that. How do you see or observe this situation? I see it as real life. I think that uh, that would be true uh, pretty much across the globe, where we have a uh, few women uh, ascending to positions of leadership and power who show us that that's possible. And, and they're very important as role models to the rest of the population, uh, where we are showing young girls especially uh, that being president as a woman not only is possible, but should be something we support, especially if we're for equality and gender equality. Having said that, the other flip side of it um, is that there is one thing that typically trumps the Constitution, and that would be culture. Uh, so the Constitution might be the premier uh, uh, legal framework for the land, but what tends to be stronger than the Constitution are social norms. And this, unless we change social norms, those patterns of behavior and roles and expectations, uh, we will not see the progress we need to see. Uh, so we are here saying uh, people need to change, we need to change our beliefs about uh, how people, we can say people are equal, but if we behave differently, it means in fact we're not truly consistent in our belief and actions with what we say. 
what should be done to you know uh, change the behaviors of individuals and the state uh, stakeholders we need to take a society-wide approach yeah because violence is uh, you you've mentioned violence you mentioned rape domestic violence it is a society-wide phenomenon it does not occur with just a certain type of person family it's across the board wealthy educated people also experience violence against women and in this regard we're saying if it's everywhere we then need to take a whole of society first and foremost a whole of government approach to say this is not acceptable and that every ministry can contribute to elevating uh, not only uh, the need for equality but the need for respect uh, I in that regard so that would mean everything from opportunities to promotions to before that recruitment of civil service uh, y you are making strong efforts in Nepal and we're saying um, we all need to do more. What is your observation about the reforms that are being taken place in relation to the new changed political context now country uh, has seven different you know provinces are you satisfied with the reforms are they in line with the uh, you know international instrument especially that of the convention on elimination of the discrimination against women CEDAW. Um, uh, the reforms on it uh, under federalism of course are still in process yeah and and as part of that process legal reform is underway where you've got laws policies that are being reviewed for possible revision uh, that is why I said there's an opportunity right now to actually elevate uh, what Nepal is doing on gender equality. So everything from provisions for citizenship to provisions for um, anti-sexual harassment to anti-domestic violence, there are policies in place, but typically uh, there's a gap between what those policies are and what the reality is. And, and sometimes the language itself needs to be changed in the law and because there might be contradictions even uh, between the Constitution and the existing laws. So in terms of um, the way forward, uh, CEDAW, the convention to which you refer, really offers a, uh, in a sense, a template of what is possible and if we use that as we need to in, in Nepal, uh, because Nepal is a signatory, Nepal just reported to the CEDAW committee uh, last October. And there were, in fact, uh, some gaps in implementation of this uh, international convention uh, that had been suggested uh, to the government for improvements. And citizenship is one arena in terms of uh, the ability to convey citizenship uh, by a woman to children and by a man, man to children is different. What are the key gaps and how can you know government's reporting mechanism be uh, made more effective? Um, I, I think it's a matter of um, putting in place systems that are actually responsive to people. And so the feedback loop between, I mean, we have uh, really a push on governance by the people where uh, federalism is giving powers to the local level. So what does that mean? If we bring governance closer to the people and decision making closer to the people, what do we need to do to monitor that? And so asking people, are your needs getting met? And I, I'm not saying that in any kind of romantic fashion. I'm actually saying that those uh, uh, councils throughout uh, Nepal, um, really as we talk about uh, supporting them with more capacity, we need to have council members we need to have mayors, vice mayors, we need to have committee members really understand uh, that they are accountable to women in Nepal. They are accountable to supporting gender equality. And that means funding needs to go to the needs of uh, that half of the population that is women. What, what might that mean concretely would include things like um, safe and secure, uh, streets, uh, the ability to say to a woman, if you're experiencing domestic violence, please do go to the police station. Because when she goes to the police station, the question is, is she being received uh, by a uh, person who's responsive to her needs, or do the police send her back home? 
we need that kind of training to elevate the consciousness uh, whereby the police actually hold the perpetrator accountable to say this is not acceptable. So instead of sending a woman back to a situation that is unsafe, really removing the perpetrator to say your behavior is not acceptable. Um, we have situations and many, many stories where the systems are not yet strong enough because they don't have the resources, because they don't have the capacities in terms of the training to respond in a way that is sensitive to the needs of women in those situations. How are you, I mean the UN women in Nepal for a long time, assisting in these all processes to the government and other stakeholders? Yeah. So let's stay on the issue of violence. One of the things that uh, we are introducing with other UN agencies, including UNFPA, um, including other UN uh, uh, agencies like UNDP, UNICEF, w we're really actually trying to uh, support the government to set up these very s uh, systems. So there is something called an essential services package uh, for victims of violence. Uh, and the, it's called a package because it includes um, different dimensions of experience. So if you were a victim of violence, you would experience uh, difficulties possibly with the health sector, with the um, uh, police and prosecution and court system, uh, possibly even with the education sector if you have children in school, what should be done with the children. Um, and uh, certainly in terms of the economic sector, your job. And we have a packaged approach that has been tested in other countries where we are coming in and saying, could we possibly do this in Nepal? And if so, how should we adapt uh, these services to address uh, the needs of victims of violence? Now, in this case, this is related also to, of course, data and statistics. Uh, again, in, in this new um, context of federalism, we want to make sure to support the collection of data on a, um, uh, on a basis that where data and um, statistics are disaggregated to show the differences because uh, what we know to be true is that women and men, girls and boys, people of different genders, they experience life differently, including in this case the uh, violations of violence. What are the coordination and existing mechanisms that you are engaged here in Nepal as part of the you know, UN entity working for the promotion of uh, women rights, gender mm -hmm. equality? That's a really important point, coordination, because you, you can't have me say, or I can't say that we have to take a whole of society approach without <coughs> also exploring the question of how would different parts of society work together on this very need, in this case, to end violence against women? So coordination is key. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have in the international uh, community two coordination bodies on gender equality and social inclusion. One is within the UN, where we have a gender theme group within the UN, where across the UN agencies, uh, we are required to advance women's rights, women's empowerment, and gender equality. So we work together and coordinate our work. And we have joint programs uh, working with rural women in agriculture is one such an example, but also working on um, education, uh, disabilities, different dimensions of development work. The other coordination uh, mechanism is with the International uh, Development Partners Group so the IDPG, where they have a GESI, a Gender Equality and Social Inclusion Working Group. Between these two mechanisms, we have maybe 35 to 40 international organizations, all of which touch money in one way or another in terms of development assistance uh, funds, and all of which have responsibility on uh, gender. So together, we try very much to not only share information, but to agree on how best to support uh, our common goals. As an example, uh, directly after the elections of last year, uh, we started to support trainings in the different provinces on JESSE, gender equality and social inclusion for the locally elected officials. Well, you worked in different capacities and you are long engaged uh, with the UN women. In, uh, you are here for uh, two and a half years. We have already discussed. How do you see the, you know, 
uh, reasons behind violence against women? What are the key drivers of violence and how can they be prevented? Mm. Um, there are different drivers. In uh, the context of Nepal. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, you know, the drivers in Nepal would not be di different for violence against women than the drivers in the United States or in Europe or in India or in China. Um, and, and that has to do with uh, values and beliefs around whether people are equal or not. And we have beliefs that connect to, in Nepal, such things as impurities and pollutants. Uh, as an example, in Nepal, uh, we know that uh, there are sometimes practices in some communities where when a woman is menstruating, she is considered impure. And I might say that when you consider someone impure or less pure than you, or the source of ills because she's impure. Um, that would be a strong foundation for inequality because that's exactly uh, the belief that stands behind um, uh, Chaupuri in terms of um, uh, requiring that women in their reproductive age uh, period uh, sleep in cow sheds and uh, how they're subjected to elements of nature in terms of the freezing colds. And we, we have seen, it, it, it's not in our far past, is it? It's, 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 it's in our very recent news uh, that women are dying from smoke inhalation in these Chaupati huts. Now, you might say, some people say, well, this is just some people in Nepal and not others. But in fact, we have modern versions of this where women are deemed impure and are deemed, they are blamed for what happens wrong in one's community, that they must have touched someone when they were menstruating or prepared food or done, what have you done? So the burden of blame that rests on women, we're saying this is based on deeply held beliefs that in fact sponsor, support uh, practices of inequality uh, that really uh, are obstacles to development. And what we want is we want greater accountability from all of us, all of us, uh, in, the, in the international community included, but also in government and civil society, to say in a whole of society approach, this really isn't okay, is it? It isn't okay that women are dying for this reason, for this belief. And how we change that must include leaders in the community, men in the community, challenging these practices to say, you know, I don't want my sister, my daughter, my mother uh, to be subjected to this. It, it's not fair and it's certainly not equal. Despite, you know, many awareness programs and uh, the presence of uh, strong stakeholders, including you and women here in Nepal, why these incidents are taking place? Merely because of the lack of awareness or, you know, on the part of government you know, actions are not taken against the perpetrators. You know, it's not just one thing, ever. It's usually a combination, and that's what society is. It's a combination, a confluence of different factors. So what I'm saying is that in every case, we have to ask, what are those traditional beliefs, those cultural practices, those norms uh, that are actually allowing this to take place? And then what are those dimensions of governance like the laws, like the enforcement of those laws, like the court systems, the police, what, what can we strengthen in order to actually uh, end violence against women? Well, how do you assess the presence of UN women in Nepal? Do you think that uh, your support, your assistance and your resources are best utilized here in Nepal by the stakeholders with utmost transparency? I think that's a, a point of process. I, I wouldn't say that we have uh, a situation that is completely settled and part of that has to do with the changing context in Nepal because we don't have uh, processes that are necessarily um, determined yet. Uh, we are still in process with the government in terms of uh, policies and, and protocols and procedures for how to actually invest in local communities. That would be one example. Uh, so it's hard to say how we're doing now when it's still in process, but I would say that I think that there's commitment all around 
uh, both uh, on the part of the UN but also in government uh, to see this through to where transparency can be improved and that would mean facilitating effectiveness in terms of making sure that uh, uh, consideration is given in a timely fashion to the need to really meet the needs of people in communities. Could you also tell us your recommendations to the government of Nepal and other stakeholders making Nepal a discrimination-free society? Well, I did allude to it earlier. I said that Nepal was uh, really uh, one example of the gender quota in elections because you have so many vice mayors who are women across Nepal who previously did not have experience in government. Now mind you, that that's not specific to women. It's also the men who, who don't necessarily have experience in local uh, governance. But given the numbers of women, the high numbers of women in local elections uh, and in their positions, uh, the, one of the recommendations is already being acted on, and that is that uh, the government is supporting uh, capacity development programs. Ms. Kusuma, there are many interesting issues, uh, but we are coming to the end of the show. Finally, could you share with us, to our audience, that I have left anything to ask you very quickly, including that of your Newman's future vision of discrimination-free society? Uh, uh, my point is we're in this together. That. Uh, the success of Nepal is the success of the UN, and the success of the UN must be the success of Nepal. Uh, our partnership is very integral to our view to uh, the future enhancement inequalities. Well, Ms. Kusuma, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Dear audience, time now to wrap up the show. Keep watching us. See you next week. Namaste. Mm -hmm.